Brockenhurst in Hampshire. The balaclavas conceal young men in their late teens or early twenties. They want to end the use of animals in laboratory experiments. And they intend to use terrorist tactics to achieve their aims. This man told us that he has guns and explosives and that he's now prepared to use them. He said he would kill in the cause of animal liberation. This man says he's being forced to violence because peaceful methods have failed to stop animals being tortured in the laboratories. He too says he's prepared to kill in the cause of animal liberation. A terrifying prospect. What's more, the temptation to dismiss these threats as mere bravado has been dispelled by this week's attacks in the name of the animal rights militia. They were the latest in a series of such attacks in which the targets have been scientists who work in animal research centres like this one in Karsholt and Surrey. Over the last 12 months, several people working here have already fallen victim to the animal rights militia. Last May, Dr. Sharat Gangoli and his wife were in bed at one o'clock in the morning when someone threw a Molotov cocktail at their garage door. If the Molotov cocktail had uh, exploded as it was intended, it would have set light to the garage door, which was on wood, and right beside the house uh, was another car parked, and obviously the conflagration would have set fire to the garage door and it, the contents of the house, and also set fire to the car next door, uh, which could have triggered off a whole series of uh, fires uh, along the road. Professor David Conning, who also once worked at the Carshalton Laboratory, was another scientist singled out for attack by the animal rights militia. In May of last year, two Molotov cocktails were thrown into the driveway of his wife's house. Professor, what do you think would have happened if these incendiary devices had gone off? Well, I think the intention was to set my wife's car on fire, and had that happened, then there would have been very considerable damage. It was in a fairly confined space close to the house. Had the petrol tank exploded, there would have been, uh, well, untold damage to the house. What was your wife's reaction to the incident? Well, she was naturally very frightened, uh, in fact, terrified. She was alone in the house with the children. Uh, I don't live there, as you know. And uh, in those circumstances, one can understand that she was petrified. Here in London, at Scotland Yard, a national team of senior police officers has been formed to monitor the growing menace presented to the public by attacks of this type. In charge of the operation is Deputy Assistant Commissioner Wynne Jones. He feels the public should understand the real threat he believes they now face. They must realize the extreme actions to which certain of these people will, are prepared to go, the lengths to which they're prepared to go to secure their objectives. And, and I think the prospect of increased personal violence is something that, that in 1986 we may well be seeing. I think the end result can only be that they will inflict grievous harm on individual members of the public, if not kill somebody. It's a grim thought with which to start the new year. But the more we've delved into the activities of the animal rights movement here in the South, the more evidence we've unearthed of a steady escalation in the use of violence by some militant groups. In the twilight world of the animal extremists, passions are running high. And regrettably, it seems only too possible that deliberate killing could be the next step. The thought of killing humans for the sake of animals would have been an anathema to the early supporters of animal rights. They contented themselves with such activities as sabotaging fox hunting, deemed by them to be a cruel sport. But even in the 60s, the issue had the capacity to spark off deeply felt passions not normally associated with the phlegmatic British character. But while in the 60s, blood sports received most attention from animal rights demonstrators, increasingly over the years, their concern came to focus on the little publicized experiments that were being conducted on animals in the name of science. In Britain, there are some 500 centers of animal experimentation. Many of them are in the south. They include Porton Down in Wiltshire, where activists allege that animals are still being used to test the effectiveness of germ warfare the Wickham Laboratories in Hampshire, and the Beebler Laboratories in Carshalt and Surrey, where animals are used to test industrial products. Other laboratories include the Royal College of Surgeons Research Centre near the village of Down in Kent, and the Brocades Laboratory at Braintree in Essex, 
which uses animals to test vaccines. The vast majority of these experiments are carried out on small rodents. In 1984, more than three million such animals were kept for this purpose. Professor Tim Bisco supervises hundreds of experiments each year. So seriously regarded are the threats of the extremists that we were asked not to say where Professor Bisco works. However, like other scientists in this field, he maintains that any suffering caused to the animals is far outweighed by the benefits to society. In the last 30, 40 years, we've eliminated smallpox worldwide. We have poliomyelitis vaccine, so it is now no longer a problem in schools for young people growing up. We have all the advances of modern surgery, which would have been quite impossible without uh, animal experiments and the testing of, of uh, materials. Here is, for example, a cardiac pacemaker, which is made uh, as a consequence of advances in electronics and material science and in biology. Quite impossible to manufacture this kind of thing 30, 40 years ago without uh, animal experiments. But despite such arguments, throughout the 70s, there was a steady growth in public disquiet about much that went on in the name of research behind the closed doors of the laboratory. The work of scientists in the animal laboratories was governed by guidelines laid down by an act of parliament, the Cruelty to Animals Act, drawn up as long ago as 1876. Since then, the type of work carried out has changed, and the numbers of animals used in experiments has increased dramatically. It's a measure of the strength of public opinion in favour of giving animals better protection that in 1979, major parties pledged themselves to reform the 1876 Act. Finally, last year, after three years' deliberation, new proposals to protect laboratory animals were at last finalised. The 1985 White Paper has become the basis of a new law about to go before Parliament next month. The main effect of the new law will be to oblige scientists to justify to the Home Office any experiments that they propose to carry out on animals. They've got to show, first of all, that the, the uh, thing that they're looking out for, what they want to find out, is really necessary. Then they've got to show that there is no way of doing that other than using animals. And then they've got to show that the way in which the experimental project is designed is one compatible with the best standards and that they're using the right sort of animal because we obviously recognize that there are some animals because of their particular relationship with man like cats and dogs which should only be used very occasionally and while one obviously wants to be careful about the use of rats and mice as well not quite the same considerations obviously apply as to cats and dogs but despite these new safeguards the new law has run into a barrage of angry criticism. A major objection is that it will not ban some controversial tests, such as the Dre's eye test, which involves putting new chemical products into the eyes of animals to test for possible adverse effects on humans. Neither does it ban tests carried out to establish the safety of cosmetics. Nevertheless, the Home Office claims that it has the support of most moderate animal rights groups. But the bill won't satisfy the more radical groups, who want all experiments to end. I don't think it will appease the extremists, because you see, by their very nature, they are not appeasable. Or rather, the only way in which they are appeasable is to do something which would rightly earn one the contempt of the rest of the community, because the rest of the community wants animal experiments to continue, if that is the price that has to be paid to conquer cancer and uh, Parkinson's disease and all those many things that we don't know the answer to at the moment. Whereas the extremists are extreme because they say end animal experiments overnight. So no, we won't appease them and it's a pointless task trying to do so. But however justifiable the government's position seems to be, it's the dissatisfaction among the uncompromising supporters of animal rights that seems set to fuel the threatening new militancy of 1986. In the South, the campaign will be built on strong foundations. There's already been a wave of attacks across the region. Groups of masked men and women have openly defied the law and broken into factory farms or other establishments considered by them to be guilty of oppressing animals. Responsibility for many of these attacks has been claimed by a group calling itself the Animal Liberation Front, the ALF for short. In the last 12 months, it's claimed more than 30 serious attacks on selected targets across the South. 
culminating in a firebomb attack on a fleet of butchers' lorries in Dorset just before Christmas. The ALF claims to have 2,000 members nationally. Its official spokesman is Ronnie Lee, a former hunt saboteur who served two spells in jail for attacks on research establishments. He's unrepentant about the organisation's illegal activities. Peaceful protest had been given 100 years opportunity to change things. Uh, people have been protesting against uh, the various forms of cruelty to animals uh, for well over 100 years and that protest, be because of the vested interest ranged against it, had achieved so very little that I think people felt driven to do something more direct. If people don't do that, it means that the animals are going to carry on suffering and I would rather see damage done to property than suffering caused to a sentient creature. The ALF claims to be non-violent, but its activities have sometimes caused considerable personal distress. Take the case of Home Office Minister David Mellor, whose house was subject to an attack in 1984. The time when my house was attacked and red paint was thrown all over it, I mean, my wife was pregnant and, uh, you know, it's not the most uh, pleasant thing to come down to in the morning. And I think it's unnecessary. I mean, why should someone like me be subjected to this sort of treatment just because I'm trying to hold the ring? I hear the doctors on the one side saying what they need to do to cure cancer. I hear the animal lobby on the other side saying what is needed to be done to protect animals. I'm just trying to do what I think any common sense person would want to do, to strike a fair balance between the two. But, you know, because I'm not in the camp with the extremists, my family has got to suffer for that. As far as the ILF is concerned, um, our targets are property. Our aim is to cause economic sabotage and to rescue animals. But it, in more general terms, um, what I'm saying is that as far as I'm personally concerned, um, if, if I heard about an animal abuser uh, being injured, then I, I wouldn't have any sympathy for them because my sympathies lie with the animals that they are abusing, because after all, the animals are innocent and the animal abusers aren't. Imbued with this kind of moral certainty, the Animal Liberation Front clearly poses a threat for those individuals unfortunate enough to get in its way. However, for the vast majority of people, the ALF represents little more than a public nuisance. Far more worrying for the police has been the emergence of a second militant organization. This one specially set up to provide the sort of coordination and meticulous planning that the ALF so often lacks. This body, calling itself the Southeast Animal Liberation League, or SEAL for short, was established two years ago, and it has already shown itself capable of much more ambitious raids. SEAL claims it can draw on support as and when it's needed, and often from surprising quarters. Its spokesman is John Beggs. We've got everyone from students to old age pensioners, professional people, unemployed people, um, lorry drivers, ex-butchers, ex-police officers even. So we've got a complete cross-section of society, which is what we seek, you know, we sought to do in the first place. Are you serious when you say you have ex-police officers? We, we have actually got one, one ex-police officer, in fact, who uh, always, always takes the police by surprise when they arrest him. <laughs> the incident which proved SEAL as a force to be reckoned with was a large-scale raid on the laboratories of the Royal College of Surgeons at Down in Kent. Green. Before the raid in August 1984, okay. SEAL members spent four months working on the details. Nothing seems to have been overlooked. One team was sent out to time the journey between the local police station and the laboratory. This told them how long they could safely remain in the building after the alarm went off. On the day of the raid itself, some 36 people, detailed to break into the building with sledgehammers and wire cutters, were divided into teams, each to perform its own particular task. About two dozen people were deployed outside, some as lookouts, others to make fake phone calls to the police. The idea was to lure any patrol cars that may have been around away from the area. One call suggested a white girl was being raped by three black youths. Another reported a major crash that needed urgent police attention. I'd like to report an accident. Yeah, in Bromley. The strategy seems to have worked. But the raiders, who recorded the break-in on video, were able to spend several minutes inside the building. 
The scale of this operation was greater than anything the ALF had ever attempted. And its purpose showed that SEAL had an intelligent and dedicated leadership. Although some damage was done, the chief aim was to gather evidence that could prove animals were being mistreated in the laboratory. As the raiders made their getaway in a fleet of waiting cars, some driven, it's claimed, by old age pensioners, they carried off a pile of laboratory records stolen from filing cabinets. No one was ever caught. From their point of view, the raid on the Royal College was SEAL's finest hour. Firstly, it proved that they could carry out a major raid and get away with it. Secondly, it showed they know how to handle the media. Their video of the attack on the Royal College was the main story on that night's news at 10. And thirdly, it showed that as well as breaking the law, they know how to manipulate it. But as a result of information obtained by SEAL members on that raid, the Royal College was, for the first time in its history, prosecuted for causing unnecessary suffering to an animal. The Royal College of Surgeons has since appealed. If the police would do our work for us, which they should be doing, and investigating our complaints and our allegations, then we wouldn't bother raiding laboratories. The reason we do it is, as I've said, the police don't do anything. They totally support the status quo and guard vivisectors. Secondly, we know there are things going on, one, that are morally obscene, and two, that are legally invalid. SEAL may only have been looking for evidence, the large-scale, sophisticated raids it organises inevitably carry with them an increased risk of people actually being hurt. Following on the RCS raid, SEAL next mounted an attack on the Wickham Laboratories, 10 miles east of Southampton. Once again, it bore all the hallmarks of a paramilitary operation, as activists used bolt cutters, sledgehammers and pickaxe handles to smash their way in and steal documents. This time, they met resistance. In separate incidents, not recorded on their video cameras, four people were physically assaulted, two badly enough to require medical treatment. How do you justify, A, breaking the law, and in some cases, causing innocent people injury, no matter what the cause? Well, dealing with the second point first, I don't believe SEAL has ever caused innocent people any injury. We are strictly non-violent, and that's why SEAL has been and always will be. People have been injured during these raids? Um, I don't... I'd would dispute that, actually. I think, you, you, I don't know which raid you're referring to. Uh, there certainly may have been scuffles, but any violence is normally been against us. Unfortunately, people tend to disregard that violence. Regarding justification of breaking the law, there's two kinds of law. There's the law of the land, which is man-made, and there's the moral law, or God's law. So Martin Luther King saw that distinction. And basically, it's, it's a question of conscience. But the police have to enforce the law of the land. Since last February, Specially appointed officers throughout the South have been engaged on a major intelligence gathering operation. By pooling this information, they've compiled a massive dossier on the extremists. And only last week, a special unit was set up to combat what the police perceive as a rising spiral of violence. Very many of the groups, the Animal Liberation League, the Animal Liberation Front as it calls itself, have up the ante, if you like, they have increased the level of protest from passive demonstration at various sites to releasing animals into the wild and creating environmental havoc as a result, to attacks on premises culminating, of course, in vicious, unwarranted and totally unjustifiable personal attacks on members of the public, politicians, scientists, etc. And I have no doubt that if they increase this level of activity, they will eventually result in killing somebody. And that is the, the cause and, and, and the extent, if you like, of the problem. But to counter this threat to life is proving no easy task for the police. It appears that people who break the law in this way stand a very good chance of escaping prosecution. 120 people took part in the raids on Wickham. Only 19 people were eventually brought to trial here at Winchester Crown Court last September. During the course of the trial, most of the charges were dropped due to lack of evidence. And in the end, just seven were found guilty of conspiracy to burgle. Among them, Michael Nunn, a former butcher from Bexhill-on-Sea, who admitted in court to being SEAL's convener. He got three years. It was the biggest animal rights trial in history, and SEAL regarded it as a cause for celebration. I think the trial was a resounding success. It was obviously very unfortunate 
that seven people were found guilty of just one of the counts in the indictment. But if you view the fact that there were 78 counts, potential verdicts on this indictment, and our members got off 71, we really won hands down. And far from being a setback, it's obviously a personal setback to those individuals who have the trauma and the stress of prison. But uh, all it will do is strengthen the resolve of animal rights activists in the southeast and the rest of the country. Um, we won't be intimidated by the police, we won't be intimidated by courts. Mindful of such threats, some laboratories and other prime targets have taken matters into their own hands and introduced security measures such as strong perimeter fencing. For as they know only too well, the police can offer only limited help. The police service cannot provide static police officers to protect every possible target of these extremist groups. But I'm sure that all those responsible individuals who own such premises are well aware of the possible threat against their establishment. And, and whilst we will do all we can within our power to assist them, I think at the end of the day, regrettably perhaps, it comes down to a level of, of self-protection. While organisations can indeed take steps to protect their premises, individuals remain vulnerable. If the extremists are to be believed, then the attacks on people like Dr. Conning and Dr. Gangoli will, in 1986, reach an alarming new level. John Beggs certainly believes there are elements in the animal rights movement who will go down that road. We asked him if this might mean a loss of life. I don't know at this stage whether that would happen, but I, I agree. I think people will start to take violent action against scientists. I think the problem is, when we talk about violence, we forget about the violence being perpetrated to the animals. We forget about making beagles vomit, uh, blinding rabbits' eyes, shooting monkeys. That kind, of, that, that kind of violence is really what we should be talking about. And uh, frankly, I, I wouldn't have a great deal of sympathy if a scientist was attacked, because although it, it may be morally wrong, uh, it's really just, um, he lives by the sword, and why not can I say he's bound to die by the sword, <laughs> in a sense. There's no evidence that either John Beggs or members of SEAL have ever planned to attack individuals. But others, namely the extremist animal rights militia, not only consider such action morally justified, they also appear to have both the will and the wherewithal to carry it out. And when we met these men in the New Forest before Christmas, they claimed to have armed themselves with all the devices of modern terrorism. They said they had remote control detonators, mercury tilt detonators, and sophisticated timing devices. We asked them how could they possibly justify taking a human life for any cause. Their reply was chilling and simple. The death of a human was worth it if it stopped the suffering of millions of animals. Putting the lives of animals above those of humans must surely strike most people as horrifying. But given that these young people have these views, given their fanaticism, we have to face the grim prospect that this week's attacks won't be the last. So what can the authorities do? That's what we'll be asking Mr. Peter Westcott, the Assistant Chief Constable of Sussex, in part two. Join us in a couple of minutes. Welcome back to this, the first edition of Facing South. In part one of the programme, we heard the deeply worrying claim by members of the animal rights militia that during 1986 they intend to murder people involved with experiments on animals. So assuming we should take these claims seriously, and the attacks this week suggest that we should, what can the authorities do? With me now is Mr Peter Westcott, Assistant Chief Constable of Sussex, the county in which one of this week's devices was planted. Mr Westcott, a very good evening to you. Good evening. First of all, your own gut reaction to what you've just seen and heard. Well, I think you've painted a picture this evening which um, shows a worrying trend in terms of the type of attack that we're now beginning to face. If we look at the... Uh, incidents of this week, particularly the, 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 the device recovered at Staining in, here in Sussex, uh, that's the type of device which, um, had it been viable, uh, and we still wait final analysis, uh, could clearly, of course, serious injury to someone. Now, it's, it's all very well for people who uh, say that they wish to kill what they might refer to as legitimate targets. But uh, in this case, I mean, there could have been a small child walking past in the road. And is that seriously what uh, these people are intending to do? And really, uh, one can only start to ask people who form the membership of uh, the wider groups, uh, perhaps legitimate protest groups, uh, reasonable people, 
is that really the, the sort of people that they wish to be associated with? And really one can only start to ask them to perhaps re-examine their position and say, well, we do really think that this is the type of activity we don't want to get involved with and we really ought to come and uh, perhaps give the police some assistance. Could I just pick up a point you made there? Um, you heard in the film the claim that they have sophisticated explosives. Are you saying that the events of this week confirm that? No, I'm not saying that at all at the moment because at the moment we still wait to final proper analysis of the devices that were recovered. Uh, my initial reaction is that they are not sophisticated devices that uh, the people uh, that we've seen this evening uh, claim to have. And of course we can't really at this stage connect the people that have been on your program this evening with those that have obviously planted the devices. But well, they could be capable of producing them, could they not, in, in view of what they've said and in view of what's happened this week? Um, people can produce sophisticated devices. Uh, I cannot, uh, and I have no evidence or reason to believe that those people that you've interviewed in, in, in that wood have that capability. They tell me, your program tells me that they have that capability or they make the claims that they have that capability. Uh, I have uh, no reason and no information to suggest that they have that capability. How is your own investigation going, by the way? There were four devices planted uh, this week, as we said, one of them in your in, patch. In, in what progress are you making? Uh, in Sussex, it's early days at the moment. Uh, it, the, the devices were recovered over the last 48 hours. Uh, clearly we're working with our colleagues in the rest of the country because uh, uh, the, the devices are recovered at approximately the same time. Uh, so we'd be very foolish if we didn't uh, try and coordinate the police response. Uh, what I would ask is that those people, uh, or the viewers, your viewers, or anyone who might have some information, clearly to let the investigating officer at Shoreham Police know of uh, any information they th might think relevant, but also, perhaps, if they recognise, I appreciate they were disguised, the people that appeared on your programme, but if they think they know who they are, to let the police at Shoreham know. I think we have a, a number which, uh, before the end of the programme, we should be able to show to people, which they can ring if they do, in fact, feel they have uh, that, that information. I would be extremely grateful. Speak, but there it is, it's Shoreham. Yeah. That's 07917, 07917, 4521. That's the number to ring if you have any information. Everyone, I think, watching this film will have been deeply disturbed by the sentiments expressed by these young people. But bearing in mind the nature of their attacks, the sporadic nature of them, the spontaneous nature of, the nature of them, we'll be asking, how on earth do we stop it? Well, I think you've raised uh, a very good point there. Uh, the nature of these types of attacks, and assuming that they are committed by very small groups of people, uh, sporadic, uh, no pattern, makes it an extremely difficult uh, task for police to combat. As I said, all we can ask, and, uh, and I think one of our major planks must be, for those people who might perhaps have some quite proper sympathy, perhaps, with uh, some of the legitimate aims of these protest groups, to re-examine their position and say, do we really wish to be associated with this type of attack which could kill people? Given the difficulty you face in preventing this, which I'm sure everyone ex w w w would uh, accept, would you not accept the criticism that the police have had only limited success in actually detecting people once these crimes have been committed? They've managed to detect some of those who've attacked institutions, but as far as I know, they haven't yet nationally found one single person responsible for attacks on individuals. Isn't that a valid criticism and well, a worrying criticism of the police? Um, I think it's a criticism. Um, the police welcome criticism. I think that we have to put in perspective the, the attacks on individuals is a fairly recent uh, tactic. Uh, prior to perhaps a year or so, uh, we've, they've concentrated mainly on property, as I think that your programme tonight has, has, has brought out. Um, when it comes to uh, attacks on people, clearly these are serious crimes and clearly they're going to be taken increasingly seriously by the police service, and particularly in Sussex. I can only say that uh, the investigations that have been carried out are very thorough, that they are going to, they are being treated in an extremely serious way. And now that we have reached this stage of attack, then the police will be putting perhaps much greater effort in than, than hitherto.
What level of threat to civilized society do you think they now, in 1986, pose? A question I ask you because I'm aware that before coming to Sussex, you served with the Special Branch and you worked considerably in the terrorist field. Some people, serious people we've talked to, have likened them to the Bader Meinhof gang in its early days. Is that the category you'd put them in? No, I certainly wouldn't. Um, the Bader Meinhof was always uh, a, a very vicious. Uh, uh, well organized, um, don't you see well signs of that here? Well equipped uh, group, and no, quite frankly, um, you've pointed out quite properly a problem that obviously we're going to face. But I do not see any similarity uh, between the people that we and the type of attack that we have seen this evening to the very sophisticated and uh, far more murderous, if that's the right question, right uh, word to use, uh, type of attack that the Bader Meinhof, right from their inception, when they decided to undertake terrorist attacks, undertook. Sincerely hope that you're right, Mr. Westcott. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Well, that's all from Facing South this week. Next week, we'll be reporting on the government plans to have a fixed link across the channel and asking what effect it could have across the whole of the South. Some viewers may find disturbing.